City Center Radio. It is episode 258, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Friday, May 31st, 2024. We're saying goodbye to May and welcoming in June. Can you believe it? We are already at that, you know, basically the halfway point of the year. You know, not exactly, but June is the sixth month. So obviously uh, we are, you know, already halfway through 2024. Can you believe it? Hope you've been having a great week. It's been pretty darn hot. I will say that. I don't probably, I probably don't need to tell you all that. You live here, you know, Uh, but it's been uh, quite toasty. And uh, yeah, we're very much in summer, aren't we? Been a little busy, uh, had an event uh, to attend this week for my job, so uh, that's one of the reasons there was no episode on Wednesday, but glad to be back with you today, uh, as well as on Monday, we'll have an episode locked and loaded for you, so uh, both are going to be interviews uh, today's episode, as well as Monday, so uh, excited about those, I always love the interview episodes, and uh, these are going to be some good ones. Today, uh, the guest is J.D. McCabe. He is a local writer and philanthropist. He also speaks about uh, domestic violence prevention uh, around the country, uh, different organizations. And we talk about his story. He is actually a survivor of domestic violence himself, as well as, you know, we're talking emotional abuse, uh, physical abuse, uh, and and on and on. Just a really harrowing story um, that he'll tell in this interview of what he went through. Although he gives, you know, quite a a good amount of details about what happened in his life and how it led him to what he currently does, uh, all the details are in the book itself which is available for purchase pretty much anywhere you can find books. Uh, The Third Gift is the name of the book. So that's The Third Gift. And he discusses what that title means in this interview. Uh, A really interesting story. And, uh, you know, he turns something that is just, like I said, horrific things that he had to go through in his life. But he's turned something that was incredibly negative into a positive where he's trying to help others and in turn is also helping himself, you know, move past what he had gone through. So it's, it's a very interesting interview. I encourage you all to listen as always. And then also, you know, look into his book if you're interested in reading more, or maybe you work for an organization that he would be a good fit for uh, to talk, you know, um, you know, in a speaker role and you can learn more details. Uh, Again, there'll be some links in the show notes where you can find out all that stuff. So Without any further delay, we'll get into that interview right now. And as promised, joining me now is J.D. McKay. Very excited to chat with him today, and I'm sure you all uh, will really enjoy this interview. J.D., thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, Christian, thank you for the opportunity. It's, it's my, my privilege and uh, blessing to be on with you today, so thank you. You're welcome. Now, before we dive into everything that you do and and your story, uh, just so my listeners can know a little bit about you as a person, uh, just let them know whatever you think is important, maybe where you're from, uh, what brought you down here, uh, any little background you think is important for folks to know before we dive into everything else. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, I'm from from, uh, born and raised uh, a large family, five brothers, three sisters, Outside of the Western Pennsylvania area, I've been gone a long time. I lived in Kentucky five years, North Carolina 19, and and recently, well, not recently, but a little over four years ago, moved down to the Charleston area, specifically Mount Pleasant. After everything that had happened, which we will talk about, um, I just needed a, I needed a, emotionally needed to get away and needed, needed just a change of scenery. So my two, two kids are young adults now, and I can work from anywhere as long as I'm close to an airport. And so I settled on the beautiful town of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Very nice. And yeah, we've, we've kind of alluded to it, the story and everything. And, and that's the reason you're here and, and the trials and tribulations and that you went through uh, have brought you to, you know, um, go speak, write. You're a philanthropist and, and, and made you go into all these things. So I guess, and I know you have a book out as well. So without giving away everything, you know, in the book and all that, if you could just kind of talk about the experience you had with your marriage and how that led to where you're at today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, the time I, I never anticipated being an author. So I'm a first time author. Mm. Uh, the, the title of the book is called The Third Gift. 
my dance with the devil and her mother. And I was strongly encouraged by my therapist at the time, female therapist. And I only highlight female because, uh, you know, it, it, it's been interesting the support that I've received from both men and, and women alike. But it was my female therapist that said, look, when you're done with this situation, which was five years of a journey through hell, quite frankly, said, you need to write a book. She said, because there's not enough books, if any, about men on the other side of the equation being in a emotional and psychologically abusive uh, relationship. So after what I would deem 17 years of a happy marriage and happiness, as I saw it at the time, you know, building a career, raising two kids, moving, you know, quite frequently for, for my job, perhaps there were some things that I, that I missed, but things turned pretty dark pretty quickly in, in about the 18th, 19th year in our marriage. And she began to, you know, accuse me of infidelity, hidden drug addiction, uh, stealing money from our marital account, all sorts of crazy accusations that were not based in fact at all. And it would turn out um, that, you know, everything that she had been accusing me of doing, she was doing. So the, the title of the book couldn't be more appropriate in a sense. The, the first two gifts are my kids. And uh, the third gift was, you know, once we had separated and there's a lot of other, you know, salacious things in, that I cover in the book, a lot of things that had happened. But once we had, we had separated, uh, it was an accusation that she made through my attorney, her attorney, when we went to our first mediation session that I gave her a sexually transmitted disease. So I title that the third gift and I see it as a gift because it opened my eyes to the fact that, OK, here's the start of the truth that, you know, the accusation she had been making, she actually, um, you know, is guilty of you know, guilty of doing and so I, being in the medical pharmaceutical field for the last 30 plus years, I had the, the knowledge and wherewithal. I spent hours and hours, uh, Christian, going through her medical claims and pharmacy claims that uh, for an insurer that you probably know well in the Connecticut marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that, in fact, she had a massive hidden prescription drug addiction. Oh, uh, she, she, there was massive infidelity on her part. And uh, again, I was able to begin to restore my identity as, as to who I was as a man, who I was as a father, and begin to be able to rebuild myself from an emotional perspective. Um, besides all you of know, that happening, yeah, besides all of that happening, I, I would also discover once we separated that she had been um, poisoning me with arsenic. I would be yeah, diagnosed. That's what I was about to ask you about. That. Yeah. It sounds like something out of Dateline. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I'd, I would die, be diagnosed by a liver specialist. Ultimately, again, I put my health on the back burner once all the legal stuff happened. On top of that, I'm thankful that my daughter made the decision to come back into my life after two years of being estranged from her. And so I was rebuilding that relationship. So I put my health on the back burner. And then once I ultimately got to a liver specialist to figure out what was going on, I told him all that I had discovered. And that's when he had suggested a, a hair and nail test to evaluate, you know, arsenic exposure. And because I had previously, probably nine months prior to that, I had a blood test done because my sister-in-law, um, who has a doctorate in nursing, suggested that, you know, she had been poisoning me. The blood test didn't show anything, but the, the liver specialist is like, a blood test is not going to show acute exposure. You know, you need a hair and nail test. So by the time I discovered that, and it, the arsenic piece only gets us a, a small couple of pages in the book, if that, because by the time I had discovered the arsenic poisoning, I had discovered the hidden prescription drug addiction. I discovered that she had used our kids for two years to fill amphetamines in their names. I started building the trail of where she was getting her meds and so forth, so on. So the arsenic poisoning didn't shock me. It was just like, well, okay, oh, well, let's, let's move on. And that was, that was just a couple of months prior to the start of our alimony trial. So we had a four-day alimony trial. We had a domestic violence trial. Once I was separated and out of the house, she filed false domestic violence charges against me that I had to defend myself in court from. And that, that, all that journey is, is laid out, laid out in the book in, in pretty, you know, intense detail. So I changed the names and I changed the locations, but the rest of the book is extremely raw. And, you know, when I wrote it, my editor said, if this was a fiction book, there would be a lot of sections that I would have to kick back to you because it's just not believable. Wow. And I, I, just, 
I said, uh, unfortunately, it, unfortunately, it's nonfiction. Yeah, so. yeah, I, it's it's <laughs> you know just that little bit, and you said there's even more in the book, so it's it's wild, yeah. uh, you know, that you went through all this. It's such a harrowing experience, and quite literally could have been life or death based on what you're saying. And it tells you something when you said, "Oh, well, you know, the arsenic poisoning was really wasn't really that big of a shock." It just shows how much you had gone through up until that point. Um, so in hearing all that, first, you know, sorry that you went through that. That's awful. Um, but I'm wondering about a couple aspects of it. You know, uh, number one, there's a stigma I would imagine about men claiming oh, domestic violence against them, you know, where people either don't believe it or they'll give you the, you know, the typical like, oh, just man up or, you know, whatever silly things people say. Did you feel any sense of that within yourself or from other people? And then on the other side of it, when you're being accused of all these things, you know, a lot of people probably just assume she was telling the truth because unfortunately women are victims of domestic violence themselves, as well as, you know, any of the other things she was accusing you of, you know, this could have ruined your life, uh, you you know, job prospects and all that. So between those two, you know, the, if people were kind of shaming you or you felt shame yourself, as well as on the flip side, she's accusing you of these things. And I'm assuming some people, um, perhaps like you said, your children, you know, uh, maybe they were believing these accusations. How did that all affect you? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the character assassination, you know, the character assassination was the hardest pill to swallow. So, yeah. you know, the subtitle of, of the book, you know, and her mother, cause her mother who, who I loved unconditionally for 23 years, didn't have a cross word with her throughout the course of our dating and our marriage. And, uh, yeah, she turned on me like a cobra, but also some family and some friends. The one thing I didn't mention, Christian, is throughout this whole ordeal, the the downfall. I also spent nine days in a psychiatric facility, um, mm. involuntarily committed. But I would later discover that two days before my involuntary commitment, she wrote letters behind my back to my doctors at the time and essentially set me up. Uh, and, and so, again, that's all part of the discovery of, of the third gift and things that I, I, I had uncovered. Uh, but the character assassination was very difficult. You would see, especially after I got out of the psychiatric facility, because that further strengthened her story with whoever she was telling. You know, he's controlling. He's got mood issues. You know, I, I'm, I'm fearful of him. It's an easy story to build. And and. Uh, to your question about, you know, man up, I, I have, and I laugh it off, but I have received that on, you know, the social media platforms I'm sure. that, that I'm on, you know, man up, get over it, move on. But I, I want to stress the reason I continue to share my story and promote the book is I'm, I'm, I'm sharing all of the proceeds from the book with several different nonprofits over the last couple of, couple of years. So I'm looking to do some good and, and to give back. But I think the hardest part for me was my daughter, she was 15 when all of this started, 15, almost 16. But without question, she was gullible and she was vulnerable and she was believing believing everything that her mother had told her. And once she moved back in with me, we didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about our situation, even though we were still mired in it. I wanted to focus on her and, and her last couple of years of high school and just trying to make it as normal as possible, even though we continued to go through the courts. But the character assassination was the hardest part to deal with um, for me. And I've talked about this on, on other podcasts is for me, the shame of it all uh, did not prevent me from, at all from sharing my story or writing the book. There was no hesitation whatsoever. The shame for me though, was as a reasonably intelligent man is how did I let this happen? How could I, how could I not have seen some things? How could I have been fooled? And, you know, people have made it very clear to me, you were dealing with a master manipulator, somebody who was able to isolate you from your family and your friends and essentially hollow you out and, and take, take your identity. Uh, and she's very good. Uh, but I didn't write the book as a, a men to versus me too, because I rec- fully recognize that men and women are equal opportunity offenders. And interestingly enough, if you look at the rates of emotional, psychological abuse, it's split 50 50 between both genders um and when you look at the physical violence side of course unfortunately men are more more times than not the offenders in in that case but there's also the flip side of that as well 
Um, so I wanted to kind of share the book for lots of reasons, but hopefully to give other other men and, and other women in general um, a voice to come forward and, and find a renewed sense of purpose once they get on the other side of it. Yeah, you know, I'm asking you these questions based on your situation, of course, and, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, you know, it's not just about shining a light on a men who go through these situations, which is, you know, great that you're doing that because there's probably men that, you know, that buy into that, that shame of, Oh no, it's, you know, I can't tell people that my wife or girlfriend is, uh, you know, uh, whether it's psychological, emotional, or physical abuse, I can't talk about that. So, you know, that's great. But you're, you're also on the flip side, like you just said, talking about how obviously this affects women too. We hear about that all the time. And, and I talked about, uh, you know, I made the little, comment about how the arsenic poison reminds me of Dateline. If anybody watches those or any true crime, we know on the violent side of things, like you said, more often than not, uh, the man is the perpetrator. So this isn't just a, hey, this happens to men too. Like you said, you, you want to just shine a light on domestic violence, emotional, physical violence, um, and abuse for on anyone and, you know, how that affects people and how they can get through it. You know, yeah, and, and to and to embrace it. And I've told some people recently, my some family members, I said, where I'm at now and all the blessings that I've received as a result of it, I'd go through it all again. And they, of course, the response was, no, hell no, please, no. Because uh, it was a long journey for five years. And, uh, and, and I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have the love and support of, of family and friends. Um, but the beauty of it is, too, which I've told many other people, the beauty, there are many gifts to adversity. And I think that the three gifts for me are an increased sense of gratitude, humility, and patience. You know, as you go through the legal system that we went through, you have to be patient because it's on, it's on their time. And, and I, I waited for 13 months for some motions to be heard. And, of course, you can't fully begin to heal or yeah. move on while you're still mired in it. But uh, there's been a lot of blessings that have come from it. I would stress that, too, that in, in the book, it's not all about darkness, but it's about faith. It's about family. It's about friends and finding your way through it and uh, truly seeing it as a gift. I mean, you, you've got two choices, let it crush you or embrace it and, uh, you know, do your best to keep moving forward. Yeah. And that, excuse me. Also, I think when you mentioned before, when we were talking about shame and all that, you had mentioned how more of your shame in the situation was how did I not see this? Which is another thing yeah. I would imagine happens to a lot of people who are victims of whichever kind of violence or abuse. And uh, I'm sure that is something that people often say and why they don't come forward um, or are hesitant to talk about their experience, which of course is, you know, everybody has their own process. Not everyone has to, you know, uh, talk about it or write a book. It, it's your own journey, of course. But Whatever people decide to do, I'm sure they can get something out of this book um, uh, and your story to learn more about, hey, wait, maybe this kind of thing is going on with me. Or, oh, hey, wait, uh, I shouldn't be ashamed of this. Look at this person and how they got through it and how they turned this negative, very negative, obviously, into, you know, some positives where, like you said, it, some good things came out of this. Yeah, yeah. And interestingly enough, the, the, the poisoning continues to be a common occurrence. I've received quite a few messages on some of my platforms that uh, from family members that had fathers that got remarried and they're like, yeah, we're seeing a lot of the symptoms that you talked about. And there are at least two occasions folks said, yeah, we, we discovered that our father was being poisoned by our, you know, by his, by his new wife. So, <laughs> I mean, there, you know, on days when you question whether or not you should continue to to share your story and promote it, there's uh, there are messages that come through that you know thank me for for doing so, and I'm I'm humbled by by the support that I've received. So that's a you know reminded me of another thing I wanted to ask you, which is I've I've talked to some other people, some on the podcast, some just in personal lives about different experiences they've gone through um, related to this topic, and they some people have decided to speak out obviously and, and have created nonprofits or whatever it may be and one thing they talk about is kind of what you just alluded to that there's some days where you're like do i need to keep doing this do i have to keep talking about this story you know it could re-traumatize people sometimes do you find yourselves in the, yourself in that moment sometimes where you're like man I, do i i got to go and talk about this whole horrible thing i've been through and kind of relive it um and if so how are you able to get out of that and keep moving forward? Yeah, for me, it does it for me. It no longer causes any trauma. Um, and, but I'll be honest with you, Christian, when, and that's part of the reason I moved 
moved to Mount Pleasant. You know, the book has been out about a little over four years. And when the book came out in March of 2020, after, you know, writing it for a year and editing and, and the long journey of getting it published, uh, you know, the book came out, I lost my mother, COVID hit, you know, so I had a lot coming down on me. And that's, that's when I said, you know, I just need a change of scenery. I just need a, a fresh start. But for me, when the book came out, the trauma that I had to deal with was my time in the psychiatric facility. I was in there. It was I've obviously never been in one, but it was the, the audience, I will say. I mean, because there were young people, old folks of my age. There were it was a co-ed setup. I'm like, this is strange. We got men and women. We're all living on the same ward. But it was the young kids that were truly suicidal that had made legitimate attempts to take their life that I would have nightmares about and showing up on, on my porch, you know, with guns to their head and there was nothing I could do about it, you know? So I went in, went into back into therapy for a while when I, when I first moved down here to process that and to process the book coming out and, you know, it's a double-edged sword because you have to reopen all the boxes you packed away. And, and I'm, as I'm writing the book, I'm like, man, I forgot that happened. I forgot that happened. Uh, and, and now I can laugh and smile about it, but it's certainly, caused me to revisit a lot of this at the time, but I'm, I'm, I'm at peace now. And I, I, there's no hesitation or no trauma caused by me, you know, revisiting my story over and over again with folks. I'm glad you mentioned therapy. You know, you also, I'm sure talk about the power of therapy, people listening, you don't have to go through something traumatic to go to therapy. I, uh, I started a few years ago. Um, I, I really enjoy it, if, if that's the appropriate word. And I know lots of people who it's important to them as well, no matter what you've been through. But if you have any kind of trauma, any kind of issue, it really can be a game changer for you. I, I would say enjoyment is the perfect word because I would I would echo that. I, I, I looked forward to it. I'm, I would obviously, as I went through this, it literally was a five year journey. I was in therapy the entire five years, you know, as my therapist was a specialist in dealing with high trauma, high trauma divorces. And I, it turns out I was married to somebody with narcissistic personality disorder who also probably had Munchausen's. And so I've learned a lot throughout the process, but I, I enjoyed going. And, and when I went back into therapy down here in the low country, I would say I, enjoy, I enjoyed it as well because I, I like the objectivity. And for those that are going through anything, one of the biggest mistakes I made which led me to probably be involuntarily committed, which led me to being hollowed out of, is, as an individual, was I isolated myself. I told nobody what was going on. Mm-hmm. It was not because I was ashamed of it. It was because I was trying to figure out what was going on with her because the other complicating factor, which folks can read about in the book, is that early in our marriage, she would allege that she had an autoimmune disease. But that would be one of, one of the other discoveries under the third gift mantra would be that once we went to trial, we would subpoena all her medical records. They subpoenaed mine. And that's where I discovered the letters she wrote behind my back were in my medical records. Yet the doctors never said a thing to me. But we would discover that she does not have an autoimmune disease. That, you know, prominent, a, a prominent clinic down in Florida that she went to twice. Um, there's nothing in the medical records to suggest she has an autoimmune disease. Contrary to that, they said she does not have an autoimmune disease. If she has any type of autoimmune disease, it's very, very rare and minor. It's a minor form, but they couldn't confirm what she believed. And uh, so we had a lot of complicating stuff going on. And And as the marriage began to unravel and I'd start to see some signs and symptoms and things that would cause me to pause, I would chalk it up to her autoimmune disease. Mm. Which, which didn't exist. And I, I, I would later get clarity that a lot of her issues, a lot of her medical issues were self-inflicted more than likely from the plethora of medications that she was taking unbeknownst to me. Uh, so it was, a, it was a journey through that mental health system, the legal system, the medical system. And unfortunately, all three of those systems, I would say, failed both of us because those her attorneys recognized that she had some major issues and nobody did anything to to get her help. Her first attorney, she had two attorneys for 20 months. They kicked her to the curb and then she sought representation from, you know, another attorney. So uh, the attorneys are always willing to grab another grab another paycheck. So uh, a lot of twists, a lot of twists and turns in the book. But uh, the systems definitely failed both of us for sure. 
Yeah, that's it's important to point out. Obviously, she's suffering from mental illness of some capacity, addiction issues as well. So I'm yeah. glad you pointed that out that, yeah, this is a horrible journey and she did some unforgivable things to you, of course. But obviously, you know, she's got other stuff going on and, and people have failed her as well. Um, and that, you know, that's an interesting side note to this whole story. Like you said, the different aspects of whatever system it may be, you know, failed everybody in this whole situation. Um, so the book is called the third gift, but that you're not just the author of this one book. You also, um, go out and speak with different organizations across the country, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I've done, I've done uh, several different civic groups. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was honored to give a talk to the, uh, U S Marine Corps base in Barstow, California, uh, to about 150 Marines. The majority of them were, were male Marines, but, uh, you know, it was interesting after my talk that I spent some time with several of them that said, Hey, how long are you going to be on base? And I said, I'll stick around as long as you want me to. And I had some really interesting conversations of some situations that they were going through. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to doing speaking in, in, in other areas around to share my journey. Yeah. Absolutely. And for people listening, whether they want to read the book, just learn more about you and your situation, or maybe someone out there that works for an organization and wants to look into having you speak uh, to their uh, group, uh, where can they find more information about you and, and all of this. Yeah. So if, uh, yeah, so uh, social media contacts would be uh, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. It's at the third gift. And then of course, uh, I don't know if you want to put in the show notes somewhere, but I'm, I'm using a public publicist with Hannah LaRue at Spellbound Public Relations. So for folks interested in any type of engagements, they can coordinate that with Hannah. Um, and then of course, the book is available through Amazon, Walmart, Target, all your major online retailers. There is an audio book out there, too, that I narrated from the, the closet, my, my closet here in my home because uh, uh, I'm trying to do it on a, on a shoestring budget. So I don't have a big, you know, big marketing machine behind me. So these opportunities like to be on your podcast are deeply appreciated and not taken for granted. So thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. And I appreciate you sharing your story. And yeah, I will absolutely put um, all the different things you just mentioned in the show notes to make it even easier for folks. So just click on over. Um, before I let you go, is there anything I didn't ask or anything that you want to mention, um, you know, that we just didn't get to that you think is important? No, I think I think the only thing I would reiterate for anybody, uh, anybody that's going through a difficult time, would be to find, seek somebody, whether it's religious counsel, therapy, community resources, wh whatever it may be, friend, whoever, confide in somebody. Because losing your sense of objectivity, when I lost my sense of objectivity, it, it, it and I'm, I'm not being dramatic here, but it damn near cost me my life. So yeah. I was pushed to the edge. Uh, aside from surviving the arsenic poisoning, the emotional abuse continued and you get to a point well, I got to a really low point. Not, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I would just say, find somebody that you can confide in, someone that can keep you grounded in objectivity. And just know you're, you're, you're not alone as you go through your struggles. The book is called The Third Gift. There'll be links in the show notes if you want to purchase it. The author is J.D. McCabe. Thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story. I, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Christian. I, it was a pleasure meeting you. And that'll do it for this edition of Holy City Center Radio. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to J.D. McCabe for stopping by and sharing his story. I told you it is quite the tale he had to tell. And, uh, you know, the whole the, the whole breath of what he went through uh, is, is horrible. But that arsenic poisoning part, just like I said in the interview, just yells, screams that this is a Dateline episode. This is a 2020 episode, true crime documentary type stuff. Just wild. Um, but I appreciate him sharing that story with us. And it's great to see he has turned that experience into a way to not only help himself continue to progress in his life and, and move past what he went through, but also helping others, which is, is always a, a noble task of uh, task, whether you have gone through something or not that you're helping people with. Um, I think it makes it even a bigger deal when someone goes through something so horrible, but then turns that into, Hey, maybe I can help people get through it um, and, and turn it into, you know, their life's calling, their life's calling or part of it. Um, 
So thank you again uh, to him and thank you to all of you for listening and to Lindsay Marie Collins with LMC Sound System for producing this and every episode of Holy City Center Radio. And also a big thank you to Tyler Boone, whose music you hear in each and every show. Hope you have a great week. Go to holycitycenter.com slash calendar to find some weekend events. If you're looking for some plans, have fun out there. Stay safe. I'll talk to you all on Monday. But until then, good night and good luck. <laughs>